Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new video in which we're playing in TNO, everyone's favorite Kingdom of England, author Kenneth Chesterton. Now, this came about because I was playing as a couple of Austin Warlords and then I realized, who is Chesterton guy? So if you'd like to read about him, please go right ahead. The AI is already completed and not a Richard but a Henry. Our people at long last have found themselves adept in the use of anger. No more do the press magnates, money jugglers, and self-interested politicians sleep soundly in their beds. The empires have woken with the rage of not one, not two, but now three. Soldier generations seeking to reclaim their homeland. And at the helm of this movement to reclaim the greatness of Britain is not a lazy seller or supposed realist, but a man whose single focus on revolutionary upward ideology finally won the day over all challenges. Even now, in the moment of ultimate triumph, do the forces that so long lied on the complacency and tolerance of the British people doubt him? They expect him to teeter and fall, perhaps into another orgy of Bolshevism and violence, and it's true Chesterton, as one of the last original black church to take up the call for strength and purity, but he will submit the unity of the British people so the empire may last a thousand years. All of the country's a stage. Can human endeavor avail to save our nation from decline and forge it for the revolution which will ensure it enjoys a more abundant life in the years to come? The second generation of the lost believe so, and they hold the F-word ideology to be the answer. From the deceived and portrayed servicemen of the Empire comes a new wave of those who will battle against the disruptive factors of civic life. Fountains, or Fountain, from the seas of the Pacific. Jordan from the battlefields of England, and Tyndall and Perry from the vil vigilance against the socialists, brave and loyal all. A new class of bright young men, educated and devoted to the preservation of Britain against the scourge of international capitalism and socialism, decay. They will carry the banner for the next stage of the eternal struggle against the decline of false society, and they will be in our cabinet as a feature of the f ideology. But the first address to the Prime Minister Chesterton, Arthur Kenneth Chesterton, Prime Minister of England. It was a sentence that even most of the fervent black shirt, or even the most fearful Jew, would not have believed uttering only a few short months ago. Yet fate has surprised England once again, and the island collectively held its breath. Both anticipation and fear as the greatest embodiment of British uh, F-word took over, or took office. Before Buckingham Palace, Chesterton stood. Microphones were set before his podium, which would broadcast his words across the radio. The smug cheer on Chesterton's wrinkled face was apparent, and his wispy white hair blew in the wind as he held or beheld the press before him. Their expressions were guarded, fearful, repelled, but attentive. Time to begin. People of Britain, Chesterton began. Your voice has been heard. It is because of you that I stand here before you. It's because of you that once more we have a voice in the halls of power. It's because of you that corruption, degeneracy, and treason has been suddenly rejected, so let my first act as Prime Minister be, thank be to thank you. I promise that your support will not go unrewarded. Across England, Chesterton's words sounded. All round, radio's families huddled, listening attentively, and sometimes fearfully. Some others rushed their children aside as they saw black shirts marching down the streets. Jews held quiet conversations with each other, speaking fearfully of the future as a new Prime Minister's speech continued. I promised you a new British age, Chesterton said, lifting a finger as his voice rose. And this promise, people of Britain, is one I will deliver, an age of stability, an age of power, an age of order. Lift your heads up high, people of Britain. For the empires are born, it is a time that we'll be reminded of our glory. A new era begins, for better or for worse. And of course we have all this stuff, but this is set up all by the AI, so I'm not really going to be bothering with this stuff too much. I converted all the divisions to militia. We still have a little bit of a deficit, but you know, whatever. Growth is not great. Um, I do want to get rid of that navy, but whatever. We're spending a lot here, but it is what it is. And after this one, we'll probably do Cry Havoc and let loose the dogs of war. In these hard times, there's no time for pleasant diversions. No posturing, fancies, daydreams, no dawdling by the wayside. These are as useless as a butterfly in the gale. For the foundations of life are threatened. It calls for decisions to be made in black and white. The fascist revolutionary knows he cannot pick flowers in these pretty fields. He has no time to spare, no surplus energy. Our black shirts now go forth to speak, to protect those who speak from the argument of broken bottles. This will not be easy work, nor will be expected to be. But above the flippery and temptations, our men shall place the duty they have been entrusted. Victory shall come to us by ruthlessness and discipline. This makes the sacrifice. This is a sacrifice we are willing to make in the Knights of Britannia. Men can only govern effectively if they are surrounded by themselves with men who are reliable, effective, and above all loyal to the ones who visions, whose vision guided the nation. It matter not if Chesterton possessed the vision for a strong restored Britain, if he was surrounded by those who sought to depose him. He would select his knights carefully, the men who would be his instruments to forge a new Britain, for four such men had been selected and each one of them had been called before him today. The first to enter was Andrew Fontaine, a man who was never without a bowler hat and one who had perpetually frowning face. His eyes were bright and shone with ambition. Behind him was Colin Jordan, the man who would be the face of England to the world, the balding man a particularly a perpetually amused face with eyes that gave nothing away. Dennis Peary was next to enter. The smaller man, dressed sharply in an all-black suit, was one of the youngest, most passionate of the National Front. Slightly tinted glasses rested on his thin nose, behind which calculating eyes lay. Finally, there was John Tyndall, a man with a rectangular face and an expression that seemed perpetually stoic, ensuring there was nothing, given, nothing was given away. Chesterton, Prime Minister of England, stood when they entered, with Tindo closing the doors behind him. He was silent for a few moments as the aging man praised his cabinet. Those who would be his voice, will, and weapons of his administration, he nodded once. 
Gentlemen, welcome to begin. Each of you have found yourselves here because you have proven yourselves to be effective. Proven yourselves to me. Effective, willing, loyal, such qualities. And men are such rare these days. I expect you did not betray this trust. He clasped his hands behind his back. We face many enemies within and with outside the government. We must be vigilant for the machination, and today we will begin a great work. Take a seat, gentlemen. There is much to be done. The National Front's divisions, once opaque, are now revealed. Ooh! Look at that. Oh, look at that, too. So now we have a third democracy. Our group has pretty much splintered into different groups here. Cool. Oh, modeling. What strange bedfellows. In this New England, there will be no difference between the international and domestic security of the people. The party is a state, and the state is a party. And the corporate state must rely on men who can withstand temptation and devote themselves wholeheartedly to the job of stamping out the thief, the swindler, and the sordid impulses that induce societal decay. Let those who fear the official induction of the black church into the armed forces. <clears throat> My bad. Uh, uh, the black shirts into the armed forces rant and rave. Their time will come soon, but the people of England who have wholeheartedly joined our crusade against materialism and degeneracy will know this is merely a step on the road to rebuilding the necessary nation to face the future. Uneasy lies ahead. Our opponents cry out that we are intolerant of criticism. That's not true. Critics have their place in the corporate state, as long as the criticism is used to build society not blow to bits. We're disinterested in the criticism of the fool and the amateur because, when such criticism is heard, there's always a racketeer standing behind the curtain. And such criticism, as it applies to the leadership principle, must be destroyed or diverted into less socially dangerous channels, not the party. Every ship or building is ablaze, and the appointed leader takes charge peremptorily, or a natural one rises to take his place. And Chesterton is that leader for this emergency. The people show a deep desire for leadership, not to be betrayed yet again by another charlatan who presents himself as a superman. And nobody who seeks to destroy their, this leader can be tolerated, even within their own party. Example must be made by the hounds of Chesterton. For years, they've been shunned, ignored, and viewed with contempt by the English elite. Even when they were all too willing to let them be the scapegoat in dealing with inconvenient problems, black troops across England had chaffed at their disrespect, but they had none to support them now that had changed. From across England, black shirt leaders traveled to London to have a personal meeting with the Prime Minister. The guards of Westminster escorted them inside, though more than a few did so reluctantly. Soon all of them were th together in a room with Chesterton, and who greeted each one as they arrived. Time to get started. The ostracization is over, he began. The old politicians began failed to see the good work of all black shirts have done in keeping our nation safe and our traditions protected. When they came begging to you for help in crushing the resistance, you answered, and you will be rewarded for your service to the nation. He clasped his hands behind his back. It'll come as no surprise for you that there may remain many enemies. There are many who oppose me and my mandate, but as a political landscape changes, so too must the black shirts. They must become ordered and centralized as your responsibilities expand. Have no fear, for you will have the funds and resources to manifest this change. A restructuring would be overseen by himself, as there were even some black shirts whose loyalty was questionable. But he kept that detail to himself. As he looked into the eyes of many, all of them anticipating being let off the leash, he smiled, yet, yeah. yes, his hounds of black would be a useful counterweight. In the case, the police provided incapable of doing what was necessary to protect the nation. No more will, your, will you fear retaliation, because you have a friend in Westminster, the chump red flag. Come, dungeon dock, or gallows grim, this song shall be our parting hymn. The workers sang and chanted loudly and passionately, reciting the infamous anthem of the long-dead Labour Party, echoing Harold Wilson's dying words. They continued to stare down the armed men in black who had entered the run-down Birmingham or neighborhood, batons in hand, to deal with a recently formed trade union that was illegal under the current English law, yet the unionists refused to back down. Many of them were minorities, strongly affected by the wave of discriminatory and anti-Semitic laws coming into effect, making it harder and harder for them to keep their jobs and feed their families. After a short yelling match between the two sides, many of the Unionists yelled obscenities at them, and the ir irritated black shirts suddenly and startling lunged forward, and within seconds were beating several of the workers with an animal-like rage. Several of the workers, fearing for their lives, retreated in a panic, yet every one of them would be arrested later that day. The workers who stayed fought to the very last, yet within a few minutes of the battle starting over, it was over. Seven workers lay dead, eighteen injured, all of them shoved in the back of an unmarked truck and off to an unknown fate. This wasn't even the first time this week. The same scene occurred in Bristol on Tuesday, twice on the same day in London, and Liverpool and Newcastle on the same day hours spent apart. Yet all the while, the police were either completely apathetic or allowed the black shirts to extra-legally punish and assault the workers, or even outright sided with them during the crackdowns. It became clear to all now the black shirts were no longer a shadowy fringe organization. They were out there, and they were out for the blood of England's enemies as they defined them. It was not the last time either. The Combat Shylock. How could it be that the great nation of England, once the most powerful civilization ever graced the face of the earth, have fallen so low? A simple man would assume that the answer to the question is easily found. A regretful defeat in the Second World War, no doubt. The truth is far less convenient than that, of course. The brave defenders of Britain were defeated not by the might of the Wehrmacht, but through a knife in the back, planted squarely by, un by traitors, cloaked as honest Britons. The National Front will not make the same mistake. The foreigner, Congress, and anyone else who holds nefarious designs for England shall be exposed as the vermin they are. Once people of England see the truth before their very eyes, they will surely welcome the black shirts with open arms as their noble protectors. With the black shirts signed into law as a legal arm of the English government, we will never need fear of the traitors ever again. In a very British purge, the auditorium was filled with a crowd ecstatic over the electoral victory. 
They assumed today they were here to celebrate, as it would be the first time Chesterton had addressed the National Front since their electoral victory. Though all of them had not been told why they were coming, and a few noticed other odd things, like how there was no media or nor any official police protection, as the security was handled by the less smartly dressed black shirts. When the Prime Minister entered the auditorium, the crowd burst into applause. Chesterton smiled as he took his place beyond the podium. My friends, he began, today is a day of victory. We have done what we all was said was impossible. Britain is ours. Another round of applause as Chesterton continued. For all those who have supported me, who trust me, I thank you. It showed off pensively. Fortunately, there are some who have seen fit to act against me in our moment of triumph. I have learned of this conspiracy against, and you will hear from it from one who has orchestrated it. He stepped aside as another man walked up. His hands trembled. His face was pale. He took the podium facing a crowd whose atmosphere had chilled in seconds. And so a halting voice began describing in detail the conspiracy against Chesterton. As each name was listed, Blackshirts moved to where they were seated and escorted them out. Five were removed, then ten, then twenty. Terror gripped the audience as they realized this, what this was. Chesterton smiled without saying a word. More, more were taken away. He didn't see the first person who did it, but when one of his enemies was removed, they cheered loudly. In the moments, others had joined in. A frantic attempt to show the complete support to him and his all cheers were removed one by one, the cheers only grew louder. Chesterton's smile grew wider as he began cheering his name. With these displays of power, we have secured the faction's obedience for now. Oh, a little bit of communism here, Douglas Windsor. Beware the eyes of much. Some of the royal party no doubt breathed a sigh of relief when the resistance was crushed by the brave soldiers of Britain, knowing the day of the reckoning would be delayed a little longer. These representatives had enjoyed their corruption, decadence, and sloth for far too long. Many questionable acts have been committed by them, and they must answer for it. Nonetheless, we are capable of mercy, and we must allow them the opportunity to support Britain and Justin of their own free will. If they refuse such an offer, then there will be consequences. There are some who would call these acts extortion, but how else should these examples of corruption be treated? Nay, what we shall do is not extortion. It is justice. And we've got a lot of manpower to prove it. Oh, Tomsk. Venomous words, patriots and lovers of England. I must admit to you, our country has been infected with rot. The rot has been caused in no small part by the money laundering Jew, or the bloodthirsty Irishman, the treacherous Pole, and all other co conspirators. All these rat like groups plotted nations plundering and total destruction in front of our very eyes, who simply would not allow it. Prime Minister Chesterton's speech in Brighton early that morning was somewhat equally stoic and icy, as it was volatile and fiery. Fascists and supporters of the National Front called it the speech of the century. Opponents and dissidents called it a madman's lunacy. Uh, lunacy filled tirade. In particular, Harold Macmillan, chairman of the United England, responded to Chesterton in a radio broadcast calling the Prime Minister a filthy, lying, degenerative mobster with a tone of fury and sadness at the direction the country has taken. The nation, however, did not get long to mull it all over, as that later that day, down the street announced the official induction or introduction of the promotion of British Ideals and Culture Act. The provision of act, said act would uh, solidify the Blackshirt's position as a supplementary law enforcement organization, expand the rest and policing powers drastically, and place it under the Prime Minister's de jure and de facto control. With parts of several Jewish-owned businesses being violently attacked by NF supporters, the Blackshirt's units emboldened to march right through the minority neighborhoods. Many people who have become targets of increasing discrimination have begun boarding boats and planes to Ireland, Iberia, and Italy, and elsewhere. Underground militia groups made up of Jewish, Polish, Irish, and even Indian citizens of England have started forming to protect themselves in the communities. It can no longer be denied that a silent war is now being waged over this act. The battle lines have been drawn as both sides prepare for a titanic struggle. The battle for Albion's soul has begun. All that glitters is not gold, though. If coercion against these criminal representatives fails, then we will play the game. Such men are ultimately self-serving. They are blinded by the lights of parties, inebriated with the taste of champagne, and become senseless as the sight of money or the promise of power. We will give them what they want. We will pamper these pigs. We will spread wealth, wine, and power across this rotten system for our own ends. For the greater good, we will reluctantly plunge our own hands into this filth that is Parliament, as one cannot perform such a thorough cleansing without getting their hands dirty after all. These fools will sell us to freedom, and the day they realize it, it will be far too late. No place for honest men. Donald Phillips couldn't do much more than stare down in horror at what the letter he was reading. He could be somewhat thankful that he'd been had the foresight to send a secretary out of the room after being given it, but that was about it. The photographs the envelope contained, as he'd be darned if he knew the senators had taken them without his notice, showed him in compromising positions with the several of the uh, entertaining at, or entertainment at the gentleman's club he frequented. Two years ago, he could have safely discarded the letter and sent a word up to the newspapers asking them politely not to print anything about him for the next few weeks. For three weeks. Now, though the royal party was out of power and thus out of favor of the Times, the Mail, and or the reputable papers. Of course, the scandal wouldn't be half the problem as, as what, what his wife would do. She might divorce him or worse, send a word up to her father, her well-connected, wealthy, and especially eventual father who was obsessed with the family honor and repute. No, letting the photographs reach the press was all right. Was right out. What should have Donald Phillips with the offer the letter contained? Nothing would reach anybody, as long as he had voted affirmative on the upcoming bill, he knew on an intellectual level that the National Front, for who else could have sent the letter, would hold, his, hold him over till the day he died. And yet what choice did he have? He wanted his proverbial head, and considering his father-in-law, physical genitalia, to remain attached to his body, none. But, and this was what the new government had to, on him to, had to wonder, what does Chesterton have on everyone else? And the promotion of British ideals and culture act. Imperialist, racist, murderous colonizer, that's what the liberals, communists, and intellectuals would call me. I mean, the simple Englishman. Such slanders for one purpose only, to make the Englishman ashamed of his nation, his culture, and himself. No longer will this be tolerated. 
to be British to be part of the greatest civilization on earth, and to be part of a rich and humbling history. For it was the British who spread civilization throughout the world and tamed the savage lands. It was a past time embrace the noble past. We'll ensure that the true heritage of the British is known and taught through this act. There will be no apologies. There will be no shame. We will embrace our nation and culture with pride, and those who did spread lies and undermine our nation will be punished. The bad and the worse. Money makes the world go round, or at least Jacob's father always said such. Then again, his father drunk himself to death in the pauper's home, so what did he know? Jacob just knew that the money his boss and the black shirts paid him was what kept Buddha on his table and his wife in those lovely Italian dresses. Ooh. Funnily enough, the job lately has been far more involved with money than Jacob had expected. Delivering it to the dresses of powerful men and giving them veiled threats, and they turned it down. Jacob hadn't had to carry out most of those threats, but some of his fellows in the empty or in the employ of the Prime Minister had of that, he was sure. When he asked his boss what all the funny business was for, at the first Jacob had expected the old blackshirt commander to brush him off or tell him it wasn't his business. The sage just grinned and told Jacob that he was helping the party change Britain for good. The first step towards the glorious future. Jacob wasn't sure how much he had bought, but he told his wife to stop seeing her royal party associated friends anyways. He had a feeling they were all looking at shorter lifespans than expected in the long run. Best decided where the victors uh, was what he tells his son when he, when he asked one day. Money can be a surprisingly persuasive tool, and to be or not to be. The fate of the act hangs in the balance. What shall be the outcome? Will the parliament reflect the will of the British people, or will the corruption of the old ways hold back the future? Britain will be set along a path no matter the outcome, but what that path remains is, is yet to be seen. Chesterton knows the outcome will determine how he's viewed. A past act would be an endorsement, to deny would be an indictment. Yeah, how does it matter now? Does it such matter now? Can it be? Can it matter when neither passage nor failure would prevent him from doing what is necessary for the nation? All will watch with bated breath, for soon Britain's path along with Chesterton's will be decided. So right now, we do not have enough support here, unfortunately. So, no matter what happens, um, and this guy's like 60 days, uh, we'll see what happens, even though uh, we should have way more support here. The act fails, but also passes. On the TV screen, a reporter announced that a new act was voted down by the MPs in the House of Commons. Opposition and many media sources have denounced the Prime Minister's incompetent. Even MPs in the government have questioned the leadership of the party. Elsewhere, people around England hear only of failure, and for every government failure, the people's confidence in the government's ability to rule is reduced. If the Prime Minister cannot control Parliament, and soon enough they won't be able to control England. Hopefully this next one will turn out better, and democracy bites back. Prime Minister Chesterton was just as surprised as he was uh, confused. England's weak and dying democratic institutions should have crumbled as he forced a promotion of British Ideals and Culture Act through the Commons. As even without a clean-cut majority, he and his colleagues assumed enough weak royal party MPs would surrender to his in inevitable passing. The vote occurred without any indication of warning. An enormous number of Royal Party and United England MPs held out along their whips. And the PBIC Act was killed on the floor, much to the amazement and delight of the opposition benches. In particular, Harold Macmillan, without a doubt, the most vocal and furious opponent of the Act, and indeed the government in general, practically leapt out of the seat in joy upon the revealing of the results. Letting a few tears roll down his cheeks, he pulled Reginald Maudling and several of his colleagues into warm embraces, congratulating them on standing the ground. Margaret Thatcher seemed indifferent, but also appeared to revel in the chaotic scene before her and the government benches. What a scene was, too. Chesterton glanced around his own ministers, and MPs jeered and howled, bellowing accusations of fraud and bribery. A couple of MPs came down and whispered into his ear, insisting a revote had to occur. He simply nodded along. Suddenly, but in his mind, he's already planning ahead. A revote was unnecessary, detrimental to his plan even. At the moment, the Prime Minister decided it was time to play the long game. One way or another, Thatcher and Macmillan would have the rug pulled from underneath them. The setback merely delayed that. Destroying them would be all the more satisfying in the end. Um, let's give it a few days, because I had to use cons commands for this, so... That passes. Um, if you're wondering about that, that's a generic one. If you're wondering about that, please go ahead. But distracting the foot soldiers? Oh, God. He'd given the opposition the opportunity to do the, the, do the easy way, or the hard way. They had chosen the letter, and so he'd oblige them. They would defy the people and hide from them. Then he would send the people to them. People of England, Chesterton and shot in front of Westminster, to a massive crowd of National Front citizens mixed with black shirts while microphones broadcast as words nationwide. You've been robbed. You sent me into the front to Westminster to represent you. Did I not say I would waste no time in fulfilling my promise? I did so, but was denied. He pointed behind him. Today, the opposition decided to split or spit in the face of all of you. They have shown that they only care about clinging to the status quo and only care about their hatred of you. They would rather ignore democracy itself before allowing the people to claim a victory. The crowd was riled up now and there were angry cheers and shouts. Chesterton smiled, but will you take this abuse lying down? Will you let them trample over your democratic rights? The crowd roared in the negative. Then do not relent, Chesterton demanded. Make your presence known, find them peacefully protest, but demand that they respect democracy. Demand that they respect you. These politicians believe they are free of consequence. Remind them who, who you are and they will listen. Chesterton had considered listing off some names of who had voted against him, but he had an idea of how this was going to go, and the last thing he wished was to be painted as inciting violence, directing the people to protest the representatives. Now that was perfectly justified, perfectly legal, and a perfect opportunity. The opposition would fall in line, or they would be made to fear. To protect the nation, of course, is next. It was raining as light night fell over London. <clears throat> Templar had an umbrella as he walked down the barren streets. He was not as dressed incognito and had been taking a more complicated route in case he was being followed. Soon he arrived in the alley where Montgomery was waiting. Read this, he told Templar, without a greeting, handing him a roll of newspaper. I heard a Templar said, taking the paper away and skimming the headline, a royal party MP was shot, rogue black shirt, so it claimed. 
Not all the news today, Monk Montgomery continued. Chesterton called a special election. Coincidentally, there's already a front candidate declared. Templar's brow shut up. He called it on the same day. No day of morning. That's cold even for him. Cares about power, not decency. And this assassination won't be the last. Montgomery's face cloaked in the shadow was grim. A strategy is working. Opposition members I've talked to are afraid they'll be next. Chesterton won't encourage his thugs, but he won't discourage them either. Chesterton has put a target on the backs of every member of the opposition. This cannot continue. Agree, Templar rolled his shoulders. What do you intend? The corners of Montgomery's mouth turned upward. I took an oath, uh, Gerald, an oath to protect England from all their enemies, within and without, and that's exactly what I intend to do, even if the greatest threat to England is the one who leads it. Templar didn't like it, but he knew their options were limited. Then we need to act before it goes too far. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. So there's the failure, but the act passes. And which we'll get to that in right now. Well, would you look at that? The act actually never actually failed, but English history is written, and we get Chesterton's triumph. The day of voting was here. Justin sat calm as he watched pre preparations for the vote to take place. All before the only moment that would matter. The voting. Pass or fail, he would not be surprised by the outcome and had planned to do what to do in each scenario. However, victory was vastly preferable. Presenting such a bill as his first piece of legislation was risky as a rejection would inherently weaken his mandate and immediate influence, yet great men did not shrink from gambles. The voting began as one by one the representatives cast their vote. Chesterton's expression did not change from just an interested bystander, though as more votes were cast, he did not hide the smile that grew on his face. Murmurs, both excited and worried, grew louder as the voting came to a close and it became clear what the outcome would be. The speaker made it official. It is the will of this chamber that the proposed act has passed. The reactions were immediate. The National Front members cheered loudly and were met with a chorus of challenge and opposition from the other parties. Anger, joy, shock, and horror filled the atmosphere. And Chesterton savored their defeat as he saw in their faces and in their eyes. He, his own eyes found those of Thatcher and Macmillan, both whom were turned to stare with unrestrained fury and hatred. The few Jewish representatives who had finally been able to be elected reacted in one of two ways. Some angrily stormed out of the House of Commons in a fury, while others sat shocked as implications of what had happened hit them. There would be none who could deny it after today. Fascism had arrived in Britain, and it was here to stay. The slippery slope. It started quietly, and the signs were barely noticeable. The average Jewish worker began noticing their pay declining and become weak, unsure at first if it was an error, or the superiors merely having it out for them. It soon dawned on them what was happening. This was the cold, sinister claws of the National Front of Play, grabbing them and slowly pulling them into a dark future where their lives were inherently worth less than someone else's on account of who they were born to. Wages were far from the only thing. Several families stopped receiving benefits and pensions, which weren't very high to begin with, even if their Jewish heritage was absolutely minimal. Those that challenged rising discrimination in court were instead found guilty of sedition out of nowhere and thrown into a cell at the behest of an NF appointed judge. <clears throat> It wasn't long either, those of Indian, Irish, and Polish descent began to find themselves at the receiving end of these practices as well, many being forced out of their jobs and workplaces, their new bosses citing treasonous and scheming attitudes. As the cases were doing so, in the span of a few weeks, minority groups had fallen under a proverbial iron boot from which they couldn't escape, and the black shirts made sure of that through terrorizing brute force. Meanwhile, several state schools had begun teaching a new patriotic race history course. Forcing out teachers opposed to its implementation and the indoctrination caused, it, caused by it has caused Jewish children to be singled out, and in several cases this last week, brutally beaten by other students. If one hadn't been paying attention, they may have missed all of this. The warning signs uh, were there with pay cuts, and the slope may be just too steep to climb out from now. For many, it was already too late. What must be done? Chesterton watched. The crowds gathered outside Westminster and wondered if those protecting him believed he was naive, that he would not have anticipated this reaction, or that there would be enemies he would have to contend with. There were a few, few, too few guards to control the massive crowds, and behind him a televised blared as media anchors breathlessly reported on the guards being assaulted with bricks, stones, and trash. The guards were attempting to push back, but they simply overwhelmed. This had gone on long enough. It wouldn't do for the vagrants to break through the gates themselves. He calmly walked over to the phone, dialed a number, and gave a single order. Put them down. He set the phone down gently and returned to the window. It was only a few minutes later that he saw the canisters fired in the crowd. Clouds of pale tear gas erupted in from the, along the streets and Westminster itself marched black shirts to put down the protest. He stood quietly, watching for hours as the black shirts ruthlessly broke the protest apart with batons, tear gas, and dogs. Chesterton was under no illusions as to what it would take for this vision of Britain to be fulfilled. Montgomery Templar, they would react poorly for, to this for certain. No doubt they were hatching a grand conspiracy against him, but Chesterton was on bother. Plots, conspiracies, he knew them well. And if these ex inexperienced men wished to try their hand against him, then so be it. The day turned to night, and he saw smoke rise over the city. He retired to his bedroom and satisfied. An important step would be taken today, when while tomorrow would bring you challenges. Today he was content. After all, his work had only just begun. And there we go. That's the ending we wanted. Now, apparently, that ending is very difficult to get, so I just had to use um, cons commands. And to get that, look at all the stuff I had to execute. England event England underscore acts dot one and do that while the voting and you'll get it done that way. But if you enjoy the video and the potential future of what Arthur Kenneth Chancellor has in for England and Britain as a whole in the United Kingdom, please do consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.